Welcome to the Mental Health for All webinar brought to you by United for Global Mental Health, Lancet Psychiatry, Mental Health Innovation Network, and M plus PSS.net and uh, Global Mental Health Action Network. I'd like to take this opportunity to say special thanks to health professionals for Global Health for their support. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be available uh, after the session is over uh, for people to view if they've not been able to join us live. If you're tweeting throughout the webinar, um, please use hashtag MH for all when tweeting. It will last for about 45 minutes. Um, and if you have any questions, you can either put them in the chat box or use webinars at unitedgmh.org. I am Dinesh Bugra. I'm chairing uh, the session. It's a great privilege to be introducing our speakers this afternoon. Uh, the panelists, as they appear on my screen, are Howard Ryland, uh, who is uh, a young consultant who's been um, working in psychiatry for a number of years, and I've known Howard uh, for a long time. And he will say a bit more about what he's been doing in terms of prison psychiatry. It's a great honor to welcome uh, Robert Van Warren, who's been a passionate advocate and a wonderful uh, driver for change, particularly in um, ex-Soviet Russian countries. and making sure that people in uh, prisons and um, in asylums and other organizations have their human rights met. And um, the next uh, speaker is, uh, next panelist is uh, Dr. Sinop uh, Ch uh, Chakarian. Uh, my apologies, Sinop. Um, uh, who's a psychiatrist, works for mental health uh, in the International Committee for Red Cross, and we're going to be hearing more about the work that Red Cross has been doing. And last, certainly, but not the least, is uh, Matthew Mutiso, who's joining us from uh, Nairobi. And uh, he's been a passionate uh, advocate and has managed to set up networks of various organizations and uh, looking after... Um, people in prisons through the Nanga Support Network. Why should we be interested in the mental health of prisoners? And I think just to remind ourselves, firstly, that a society is known by the way it looks after its vulnerable, and particularly uh, people in prisons who, uh, as we know, there's considerable amount of data from um, the USA at least, that 66% uh, of population in US prisons has a psychiatric disorder. So they are basically in asylums, but without appropriate treatment. And I'm sure uh, we will hear more about uh, the rates and the extent of problems from other countries uh, around the globe. We've got wonderful speakers representing different parts of the world. So one of the big challenges really is that um, what do we as, uh, not only as mental health professionals, but also as members of the societies um, do to advocate and what are the lessons that uh, we can learn? So if, without sort of further ado, if we sort of move on to um, our first panelist, Howard, do you want to sort of take it and run with it? Yes, thank you, Dinesh. Um, yeah, so a little bit more about the um, work that I do clinically. So I work as a psychiatrist in a prison in the UK, which is specifically for people who are foreign nationals. And I work there as a part of a secondary mental health team, which is known as the, the InReach team. And we work in a, a multidisciplinary way. So I work with mental health nurses, psychologists, pharmacists, uh, and other professionals. And we also work with um, other key professionals, both healthcare professionals like GPs, 
but also very importantly prison officers who, who play a vital role in supporting prisoners mental health um, and I see severe mental illness um, that people experience in prison so this could be a condition that was known about previously or it could actually be the first time that someone receives formal support for their mental health and I, I see a wide range of illnesses such as schizophrenia depression and post-traumatic stress disorder um, so usually I'll see people in an outpatient clinic in the healthcare section of the prison but I can also see people on the prison wings and also sometimes in the segregation unit um, and we use a, a wide range of, of interventions so starting from things like psychoeducation so it can just be signposting people to information about their diagnosis um, helping with things like sleep hygiene or relaxation techniques um, onto things like prescribing medication um, liaising with our psychologist colleagues for further input um, and in, in more serious cases considering whether somebody actually needs to be transferred to hospital for further care um, and Dinesh as you said there's a, a very high rate of mental illness in prison so um, thinking about some of the most common severe mental illnesses you have a rate of about one in 30 prisoners has a, a psychotic illness like schizophrenia or one in ten has is thought to have major depression and actually these are much higher rates than in the general population and if you think that there are over 90,000 people in prison um, across the UK actually this translates to a lot of people um, with quite serious mental health needs across the, the whole prison estate add to that the fact that prison can be a very stressful environment for, for a whole number of reasons so not only is there obviously deprivation of liberty but there's also can be considerable uncertainty about somebody's legal and social situation that reduced support they get from loved ones and also some people may experience victimization or bullying in prison as well and also it's it's important to think that people can come from quite a disruptive social situation before they come to prison and they may have actually had limited access to mental health and other healthcare services in the community because we, we know that about half of all prisoners um, are not registered with a GP before going to prison uh, and also people move frequently between prisons so it's important to think about con continuity of care so making sure that somebody's medications are pres correctly prescribed when they transfer to a new prison. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Howard. So, can we sort of move from a sort of high-income country to low- and middle-income country and ask Matthews, and then we'll go into sort of much more global challenges, particularly in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. Matthew, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Dinesh. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, my, my work in prison started uh, around 2018. Uh, where I had a brush with the law and I happened to find myself in one of the institutions here in Nairobi School uh, Industrial Area Prison. Uh, I stayed there for about three weeks and uh, my experience there transformed my thinking about uh, prisons in Kenya. Uh, there are some things that I observed while I was there. First of all, is uh, there was a, a, a similar characteristic, so pattern of the people who were there, the men I found there. For example, most of them came from poor backgrounds. Most of them had issues of school dropouts. Most of them had uh, no opportunities for employment. Most of them are below in terms of education. Uh, most of them had uh, issues of uh, illegal arrest uh, found in poor neighborhoods. Most of them had uh, issues of drugs, alcoholism, rejection. I could see all these things, abandonment, or maybe even uh, uh, rural uh, to urban migration. So that that aspect alone caught my attention. And uh, I could see uh, uh, the prison is place that I was in had about 3,000 inmates. It is a remand center, yet it's supposed to house about 1,500. So from there, I could see something that was not right from the word go. And uh, this, what I saw eventually, when I came out, I came to learn is what we now call ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. That's the common theme, the common thing that you find in many persons who are in prison. And that one made me now decide to 
to give back to inmates because I had experienced firsthand. Indeed, I realized there's a connection between crime and mental health. So since then, I, re, uh, I started a program. Immediately, I left, uh, I, I went back immediately and asked for permission to do psychosocial programs to understand more why are men prone to committing crime. And that's how I started my programs. That is in 2018. But in the process of also doing my programs, most of it were therapy sessions. I'm not a psychologist myself. So what I'll do is to invite psychologists. We do therapy sections in the prison. And also I realized for the proper administ administration of justice, there has to be an holistic approach. And that's how I started involving also correctional officers. And we started some programs with them, for example, 10 week programs that would talk into them, uh, issues of uh, uh, stresses in their jobs and all that. So we've been doing that for now about two, since 2018, but uh, COVID came and disrupted a little bit. But over and above that, uh, we also, dis uh, uh, there's another aspect that we discovered that uh, what uh, Howard has uh, alluded to, which we, we call pains of prison. There are other deprivating factors once somebody finds them in the, in the prison, for example, uh, issues of nutrition, which compound the stresses, mm. issues of beddings, vectors in the prison, and all that. And these, all those uh, add to stresses and other issues for a person in terms of the, their mental wellness. Briefly, that's what Nanga does. Uh, I'll stop at there at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to that because I mean, I think one of the major challenges we are in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, what are the kind of implications for people who are confined and, you know, may not be able to sort of um, keep themselves uh, isolated or, um, you know, look after their health and particularly, as you say, that, you know, kind of um, the level of occupancy is so horrendous that it's, you know, even more difficult. So let, let me kind of move on to Robert. Uh, I mean, what's your experience has been in, um, I mean, you've been working in ex Soviet Union states for a considerable period of time. And in terms of prisons and the way uh, prisoners are treated, I mean, has there been a shift in the last 20 odd years or is it still the same? Yes, there has been a shift uh, in some countries in the right direction, in some countries initially in the right direction, then going back. So um, we got involved in uh, prison mental health about 20 years ago in uh, St. Petersburg was our first project. Uh, Kresti prison, which at that time was the largest pretrial prison in Europe, made in the 19th century for two and a half thousand prisoners. At that time, there were 12,000. Uh, in cells with uh, six bunks with sometimes up to uh, 12 people sleeping, so sleeping in shifts. Uh, guards uh, going up and down a, co a corridor with dogs, uh, Kalashnikovs, and these black hoods over their heads so they would not be recognized and killed outside. Right, So it was completely a horrendous uh, situation and the worst was the psychiatric department which was in a cellar where people were basically rotting away. We found people that had been there for two, three years without any treatment, uh, you know, almost no bedding. And you can imagine in the winter, this prison is very cold. In the summer, it's very hot. So, you know, the absolutely adverse conditions. And so the director of the prison then was a, uh, for uh, Russian standards, very open-minded man who really tried to do something. And so for seven years, we worked in order to try to turn the psychiatric department into something um, more therapeutic, which um, at that time worked. It was the beginning of the Putin period and uh, there was still quite a lot of things were possible. Uh, what we now see is the, uh, well, this prison has been closed. They have been moved to a new facility, which is um, uh, technically maybe modern, but in fact, even worse. Uh, because uh, they created a monster with uh, 13 um, floors above ground, six below ground, all you know with high tech, which doesn't function. So prisoners have really been reduced to you know little cogs in the system. I think the the best example of the problem that we are facing in these countries, and that is not only in Russia, it, it, it's uh, throughout the region at various levels 
is I once uh, we worked in uh, Kaliningradsky Oblast, which is this small piece of uh, uh, Russia, former Prussia, um, uh, in between Poland and, uh, and and Lithuania. And right in the capital, uh, Kaliningrad, is a camp, work camp, and that work camp has the uh, prison hospital and it has a psychiatric department and we went there and uh, you know it's probably one of the worst things i ever saw in my life and this director was standing quite proudly next to me in his military uniform and uh, so i asked him so how is this possible he said well you know all these people with medical problems are uh, simulators and the worst simulators are those who pretend that they are mentally ill so i make the conditions so bad that they'll beg me to send them back to the normal cell right so this is the, you know, the basic attitude. And uh, yeah, in some of the countries, this is changing. Uh, Baltic countries, of course, because, you know, it has become part of Europe. So the standards are different. Georgia, uh, quite a lot of progress in the right direction. Um, Ukraine, we are working, uh, especially since uh, the uh, Maidan revolution in 2014. Uh, but it's really very slow because the main attitude of the uh, prison system is uh, security, 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 security. So forget about any therapeutic environment. Um, and um, also totally not understanding that prisoners actually have a high rate of uh, mental health problems. Uh, we went to the... Um, uh, pre-trial prison in Dnipro, which is in eastern Ukraine, and uh, the director, they, the, the prison has something like five, six hundred prisoners, and the director was convinced that only four of them had some mental problem, mental health problem, right? And uh, so, yeah, really have to start from, start from scratch in order to explain to them that this is actually also in their own interest. If mm -hmm. you deal with the mental health issues of your prisoners, life in the prison will become easier, and work in the prison will become easier. And this yeah. is the only entry point, you know, unless you start talking about work conditions for the staff, their mental health, they will allow you to start thinking about the prisoner's mental health, because otherwise they will block everything. Thanks, Robert. Then let me bring sort of Sanov in. I mean, as ICRC has been sort of fairly heavily involved globally, I mean, what are the lessons and what do you observe? Um, in, in terms of the sort of mental health of prisoners, and then we'll uh, sort of move on a bit about the impact of uh, the pandemic. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, yes, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, quickly to introduce myself. I'm a psychiatrist in the mental health uh, unit at the um, International uh, Red Cross. And it's uh, uh, not a coincidence that, let's say, the psychiatrist was given the detention file, uh, uh, right? Um, and um, maybe it's important to say that the ICRC's entry door is always uh, in a conflict area and, let's say, initiates from protecting political detainees, right? Especially. Uh, um, um, what uh, is uh, written in the IHL, um, so that that comes as a very particular angle. Now, nevertheless, um, I think uh, the uh, International Red Cross uh, uh, covers a very holistic approach, so that, for example, basic infrastructure like food or hygiene um, is 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 uh, always uh, um, part of the response. And the mental health, as everywhere else in the world, comes in last a bit, right? Actually, through health in detention. And this is maybe uh, already a lessons learned. I can say is that uh, we we need to go through our uh, somatic health colleagues, uh, so to say. Um, it's it's uh, somehow gives it more credibility if it's integrated and not separated. Um, the problem here is only that the persuasion of the health staff to also take over this part because most uh, don't want to deal with it. Um, I think uh, in our settings, uh, what, what we see a lot is that there is no human resources. So we have a huge problem actually to have 
uh, educated staff uh, uh, right that that can be placed and and take care of this complex cases um, and and maybe a third element is uh, uh, this kind of myth that also especially the psychologist uh, I'm very good with them but uh, they're usually uh, um, kind of uh, uh, seen as potential spies at least right or do they have a dual uh, um, kind of uh, loyalty on the one hand reporting also for forensic reasons right? the government and on the other hand uh, to build a trustful relationship and 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 this uh, uh, dual it's uh, very difficult to integrate but i mean i think uh, what i mean when you were speaking i don't know whether you could see i mean robert was nodding and obviously there's a kind of tensions between physical and mental health and you know this kind of artificial separation between the two is kind of you know this is somebody else's problem so i think i mean one of the big challenges particularly in times of covid i mean we talk about infections but we never talk about the impact the infections has on people's mental health and well-being those who have suffered those who have lost people and those who survived is you know survivor guilt so matthew can i sort of come to you as to you know what's it like uh, at the present time i mean you know although in the uk at least vaccination has started and you know significant proportion of the population has been vaccinated so what what's it like in nairobi uh, uh let me let me the prisoners and you know the kind of uh, pressures that uh, they and the staff may be under okay thank you dinesh for that question actually in nairobi the vaccine has just landed i think uh, two days ago so but uh but during this period the the prisons in themselves became no bonds no go zones so basically we could not continue with our our programs and all that uh but uh even even uh, as we speak what we try to do in relation to the inmates is that uh, we we started a drive in one of the institutions to to provide them with the basic uh, welfare uh, san, san, sanitary items uh, besides that we also started another uh, drive to build a library but and also work mostly with the correctional officers to to create uh, team building activities for them so that at least their mental health can be stable because they are they had been working under immense pressures and and uh, uh, during this period because uh, the, the conditions in prison were very strict and tight but as a country yes the effect of covid actually had really really uh, serious effect mental effects in the entire population starting from kids who are going to school to teenagers uh, yeah. even to parents and all that and we've seen especially for teenagers we've seen uh, and mostly to the girls we've seen a high prevalence of pregnancy which has also in one way or another uh, compounded mental health issues because uh, if you're a teen and maybe you become pregnant what happens is that uh, there's stigma there's trauma there's uh, all these postpartum depressions that come along with it. Parents have also been stressed over that. There's issues of other people living, uh, being uh, made redundant, or maybe you know, jobs have been lost. So the also, also that aspect brings another element of psychosocial distress to the population. There's uh, incomes have reduced uh, for families all over. So, and now there's also uh, apathy there's, a, there's a, a cold feeling towards the vaccination. People are not certain whether it's genuine, whether it's real. There's also been a, a lot of political uh, issues going on in the country as you speak, uh, not uh, perhaps just Kenya and all that. But uh, in, to in general, uh, holistic view is that uh, even something that has contributed for the coalition to be formed is that there's a dire need for discussions on mental health uh, within uh, since we started the coalition that is in September uh, up to now we've seen a hundred organizations joining us and all these organizations are at community level and each organization brings a different program for example programs like I had mentioned earlier programs with teenagers problem programs with LGBTQ problem programs with uh, mothers programs with uh, young young kids programs at the community level even you're talking about issues of culture stigma with mental health it it's for me that's an indicator 
uh, an overview indicator and all these organizations comes on board with with uh, members some organizations have uh, multiple organizations in them it's like an organization for a county a county has a population of about uh, maybe 500,000 people this indeed it tells it's an indicator of how there's a dire need for conversations and discussions around mental health people want solutions people want uh, uh, investments, especially at preventive level, you find like there has been a neglect, a complete neglect. There is no resources completely. So as we speak right now, uh, if I'm to give a paint a picture of where we are as a country uh, in terms of mental mental health, is that there is a, a an urgency to move to to bring to mobilize resources to to see what we can do uh especially as we're going forward for it towards recovery and building resilience thanks Thank very much matthew uh, so robert what's i mean with the pandemic uh obviously all the sort of steps that you had taken or the progress you had made seems to have sort of you know probably i if not slowed down if, if not frozen then it certainly slowed down and what, what are the lessons? I mean, what, what do you think we as a global community ought to be doing? Well, you know, the uh, it's very hard at the moment to, to say to what extent things have been reversed or slowed down forever because the institutions are closed. Um, we have no access. We have, you know, some contact with the management. Um, I think in the uh, you know in the countries where we're working with the prison system, at least they've been trying to provide a personal protective uh, equipment to their uh, to the prisoners. Um, I am much more concerned about another sector which is formally not falling under the heading of prisons, but in fact we're talking about about prisons, which are the social care homes in former Soviet mm -hmm. republics, right? Uh, I mean, they are euphemistically called social care homes because they're definitely not social. Uh, they hardly provide any care and they absolutely are not reminiscent of any home. Uh, in Ukraine, about 30,000 people are locked up in these institutions. Uh, in the whole of the region, probably up to 300, 400,000. And the majority of them will never, ever come out. I think in Ukraine, 90, 95% is in there for life. And so these are the, you know, people who have a life sentence without ever having committed a crime. And it's not that they are all people who have a mental health uh, issue or a mental disability. There are a lot of them are people who have wound up in these places because they just didn't fit in society or their relatives wanted to get rid of them. Um, and they, it's a meat grinder, this system. And there, um, very little is done to protect them. Uh, and you can imagine how much these trap these people must feel when they have they know something is happening, but they don't get information from the outside world. They get mm -hmm. only, you know, the standard information from the management, which is usually in the same type as, uh, you know, if you go out of this institution, you will get raped. Every outside, it's very dangerous. So that's why we never let you out. Um, and there is no way they can protect themselves. So mm -hmm. at least so, in you I mean, we've been going back to the point that Matthew was making earlier in terms of the sort of adverse childhood experiences. And, you know, I'll come back to that when I sort of would want to talk to Sanop about it. But it, it also sort of seems like that this is kind of ongoing trauma for these people who are sort of trapped in there. Yes, I think this is, you know, it's um, it's not only for them a trauma, it's tr a trauma for, you know, um, the whole network that is is around them because there is no progress. Nothing is helping. Is is you know trying to reverse to reverse the system because it's fundamentally corrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we are trying to do is to use the COVID situation by advocating among the general population that listen, you have these people locked up in your institutions. You think it's bad for you to have the restrictions because of COVID. For them, it's the normal life. They now have a double kind of double lockdown, right? right? And so we are advocating in society to finally tackle this and to open their eyes and do something about the situation. Thanks uh, very much, Robert. How would sort of so? What are the lessons for the UK prison system, the penal system, and you know, kind of you 
very poignantly highlighted um, you know the numbers and the pressures they are under so what are the lessons for the uk well uh, you know i think it's in a similar way to um you know other colleagues have described covid has been a, a hugely um challenging experience i think for the prison system in, in many ways um, I mean, certainly from you know my own work, I've, I've noticed that actually what we've seen is there's been uh, you know, an, an increase in um, increase in the restrictions necessarily because of concerns about the virus, and that's had a, a significant impact on people's day-to-day -day life. So, um, you know, some of those other activities that would normally be available for people, um, so um, vocational opportunities, um, education opportunities people haven't been able to access in the same way um, and I think that's been extremely challenging um, and I think you know the, 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 the key now will be actually how do we um, move forward from the, that kind of situation um, how do we reinstate those kind of activities those kind of opportunities and ensure that the prison um, environment is one that actually fosters rehabilitation because I think those things are also vital for for mental health um so you know i think we're going to have to um work out how we're going to do that um as the the, the epidemiological situation changes over time thanks howard uh so no, i mean in you you were kind of talking about uh, people in uh, particularly areas of conflict and the problems which are kind of additional stressors for people's mental health and well-being uh, so I mean, in terms of the pandemic, how do you see uh, us coming out? I mean, I think one of the big challenges really is that, uh, you know, at what point do people in those kind of situations get the vaccines if they do? And, you know, what are the challenges for ICRC and what should we all be uh, pushing for? In, you mean in connection with prisons? Yeah. Or generally? Gen both. I mean, in terms of prisons, but also in terms of conflict. Mm. Mm. Because, I mean, I think one of the big challenges, and we haven't had time to, uh, we'll be talking about it in the next webinar, is about sort of refugees and asylum seekers who are kind of, you know, being held in prison-like settings and the, you know, pressures that they are under. But uh, in, in, in terms of sort of both uh, the challenges uh, that we face, as clinicians, as policymakers, as advocates? Mm. Well, well, I think the priority becomes, uh, of course, also a, a big question, right? Uh, if, if you have uh, COVID around, usually that uh, 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 dominates everything, and usually then the other topics become a bit uh, secondary, right? Um, I think that um, m maybe a connection we could see is that um, uh, there, there has been a lot of additional stigma and discrimination, let's say, towards uh, um, uh, people with COVID or having been uh, connected with COVID, like health staff also, right? And we, for and, and it's become incredibly challenging with this double burden of, of uh, having to provide services and stigmatized because they might be COVID carriers. The corona carriers so we do a lot of work with actually the frontline staff uh, who support them with getting kind of managing uh, so that they keep being a workforce and don't uh, right collapse because as far as i know in the uk for example also one problem was the almost half of the uh, health staff workforce was not present i think or not available in that sense being that they had corona or uh, they were on work leave. So um, how can I say the, the corona for sure diminished all already uh, uh, scarce resources in addition. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing maybe connected with the children and the adverse effects. Um, uh, maybe a comment, I, I think that, of course, if we think of child soldiers somewhere or, uh, let's say, young adolescents uh, uh, suddenly becoming uh, amputated in Gaza, um, of course, these people have a high, uh, let's say, probability 
to maybe become delinquent or at least do something that would make them end up in, in prison. So I think that it is one of our program intentions to take care of these kids as much as we can to reduce potential harm. Thank you. Um, okay, I think uh, we have just reached that point where we take questions from uh, the audience. Uh, Anna? We haven't had any audience questions come through yet. Um, okay. So if anyone has any questions, they can send them through or Dinesh, you can carry on. Lovely, thank you. I mean, I think one of the things that sort of really um, worries me about the kind of prisoner mental health in general is A, that the rates are quite high, you know, and very often across the globe, countries tend to sort of like in olden days, they would send people to asylums and, you know, kind of outside the city and let's forget about them. So they kind of send them to prisons for minor um, offenses or no offenses. I mean, you know, as uh, Robert was so sort of eloquently describing that in the social care homes, um, you know, there's no care and it doesn't feel like home and it's just being locked up. So what, I mean, on top of that, I mean, the, in, in, um, Sanab, you kind of also mentioned the question of stigma, uh, that, you know, there is stigma against mental illness and there's stigma against prisoners. So there's a kind of double jeopardy, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that we have to deal with. And thirdly, on top of that, if we get COVID and, you know, the kind of stigma of uh, what it's like suffering from the illness and being isolated, secluded. So, I mean, in Nairobi, Matthew, I mean, if a prisoner develops COVID, what are the kind of um, processes in place and what happens? I'd say uh, thank you for that question. And I like the way you actually elaborated some of the pains. Uh, one, one thing about our prison system is a very seclusive and secretive uh, affair or situation. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's very much demonized, even from the public itself, or even from the government angle, it's seen as a more of a punishment place rather than even a healing place. And like, mm -hmm. uh, it's obvious, many of the people in prison, even in Nairobi, some of them are, are absolutely innocent. They have just been arrested for for petty offenses, and uh, maybe some of them are even not criminal per se. There have been there have been allegations and all that. So I I I want to say that uh, it's 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 hard, even as I speak as from somebody who who engages in uh, with inmates who have been there for quite some time to really even give a conclusive answer to that based on data or information that uh, is it can all uh, really be bankable or used even to to create policies or maybe to for advocacy work uh, because of the nature of how uh, prisons are seen and and one of the things one of the core things that even contributed to us having these programs is because of what i think you has alluded to because even the the prison system itself doesn't have psychologists in place uh, what what they have is psycho, is social uh, social workers who tend to to work as a, as a counselors or maybe welfare officers. We don't uh, and the few psychologists perhaps who are qualified are given more other administrative duties, not even uh, psycho counseling or anything like that. But I, I I want to say that indeed there's been that uh, element of strain for many of the inmates. There have been pressure. We don't know even when they are going to get the vaccine, if they are going to get it at any time, or maybe they, they'll be maybe secluded in the process. And uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that uh, maybe uh, needs to be looked at from a different perspective. Prisons need to be more of healing centers rather than of punishment center, because daily going on and on, we're realizing that people who are going to prison uh, are entirely not criminals per se. There's another way of alternative mechanisms or diversion justice that can, can be administered to many people who are, who are finding themselves in prison. 
Thank you. How would, I mean, in terms of, I mean, taking sort of uh, Matthew's point one step further, in terms of rehabilitation and, you know, probation, mm -hmm. taking, you know, the prison bit into account and then taking the sort of mental illnesses bit on combined that. So how do you think we ought to be moving forward? I mean, do you know any examples of good practice that we can sort of learn from and say, this is the way forward that we can do something about? Well, you know, I think Matthew's point about diversion and alternatives is an extremely important one. And we have seen some move in the UK really since the, the influential Bradley report, which actually emphasised the importance of trying to divert people from custodial settings, from the criminal justice system um, to mental health services where appropriate. And we're seeing a whole range of, of services in the UK, for instance, liaison services working in police stations, um, in courts um, and, and in other settings. And I think there's a real opportunity there to actually um, provide mental health support in um, really innovative ways that, that actually prevents people from um, experiencing the kind of situation that can exacerbate their, their mental health difficulties. Thank you. We've got sort of three minutes left. So I'm going to give a minute each to Sanop and uh, Robert to hear your thoughts as to what do you think is the way forward? Sanop. Oof, the way forward um, is, I think, a lot of communication. It needs, there needs to happen a mind change, uh, in my opinion that actually we we as a society including the decision makers come to the conclusion that these people deserve care and they deserve really a care similar to the community and that it just doesn't remain an empty phrase i i think that would be my point but i mean i think one of the big challenges for mental health is that the community doesn't get pretty good you know, kind of resources to provide mental health services the community needs. And that's, you know, part of the kind of stigma thing that we were talking about earlier. Robert. Well, I think Matthew is uh, absolutely right. I think the in many countries, the prison system creates the criminals, right? Um, if you find, uh, like uh, in one of the pretrial prisons in Ukraine, I, we found a 16 year old boy who had been inside for already a year waiting for his trial because he had been smoking marijuana. You know, after a year in this prison, you come out, you're not going to be part of this society anymore. You are bound to be a criminal for the rest of your life. So I think the fundamental issue is uh, attitudinal change. Uh, these people are seen by society as mad and bad, and the prison system sees them purely as bad and says that mad part is, you know, it's even fake, it's, it's, it's simulating. So unless you bring about this attitudinal change within the system and also within society, you will continue to see these uh, type of situations. I think that's a very good point to end on. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, uh, Robert, Howard, Matthew, and Sanop for your contributions. Uh, this recording is going to be available uh, very shortly on uh, unitedgmh.org uh, slash news website and as I mentioned earlier that I will be chairing the next webinar at the same time in two weeks time on March the 23rd when we will be focusing on uh, the mental health of uh, migrant populations and you can visit the website uh, unitedgmh.org to join and to submit questions uh, in advance of the session. Uh, you will also find out more details about the panelists at that time. So thank you all very much for joining me. Really appreciate taking time out. Um, stay well, stay safe, look after yourselves. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.